And I can think of no better person to help us explore the lies in a lot of these areas and teach us about the truth that we've been denied than the man we have with us today. He's been studying the material for over 30 years, and he lays a lot of it out in his great presentations and lectures hosted on his website, universaltruthschool.com, all the way from Melbourne, Australia, Santos Bonacci. Santos, welcome to THC. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. Absolutely, man. It's a real pleasure. I've been digesting your lectures for a while now. They're very engaging, cover a lot of material. There's a lot of things I hope we can touch on. I thought a good place to start is with this short little paragraph I found in the description of your Reclaiming Dominion lecture. I think it really summarizes the case I'd like to make in the first half of the show, which is the inventions from the kingdom of ideas that is Rome are the Gregorian calendar, the Latin language, capitalism, fictional Christianity, democracy, canon law, maritime law, phony money, and the corporation. All of the above are fictional creations of the elite families of the world through which Rome has subjugated and enslaved the whole inhabited earth. Wow, that is a powerful paragraph. Can you elaborate on some of that for us? Yeah, well... uh... Rome has been at it for a long time, in particular the elites. These families have um, amassed wealth in, in, and kept it in their uh, family lines for um, for a long, long time. That's the secret of their uh, control over the rest of mankind. <clears throat> it's the wealth, you see. They can buy all the support they need. And these families actually got the, the coup of the, uh, of the century, uh, last century in... Um, in 1913, when they got their new uh, charter, they had two previous charters in the United States, but um, <clears throat> this was the third charter of the private central bankers. And the families were all represented there, you know, uh, the, um, the Rothschilds and the uh, Rockefellers and the Morgans <clears throat> were all the Warburgs, the Schiffs, they were all there, and they um, chartered the Federal Reserve. And so through that... Uh, Rome has controlled the masses because it is it is a Jesuit um, organization. It's run by the Jesuits and uh, by the Vatican. They run everything really. They sort of um, they do everything um, uh, behind the scenes. It's it's um, it's a shadowy cabal. Um, this uh, Roman elite uh, world that we live under <clears throat> and. One thing that must be understood is it's not just the money component that controls mankind, and it's not just the, and it's not the political and the positive law that comes from Rome, but uh, the third branch would be the uh, religious side of it. Um, the ecclesiastical system runs is behind all of it. They run the courts. Um, they run. Even the the politics, because the politics, uh, for instance, your um, your local councils and everything like that, they all obey the um, the parishes. <laughs> it's not the other way around, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, there's so so the land that we live on is parish and council, or you know, we could call that. Um, the the political part of the aspect of the uh, corporation. You see, um, I don't know what you have there in your country, but here we have councils, municipalities. You know, in in America, there's boroughs, uh, counties. The Jesuits have provinces, and they trump the political um, system. So it's all ecclesiastical. When you go to court, you're going to a bank, and the judge is an ordinary, which is an officer of the Inquisition. He has to his right or to his left, he will have a, a, a clerk, which is nothing other than a cleric. <laughs> and that's the most powerful man in the court, by the way, the, the cleric, the clerk. And, and, of course, the whole lot of it, I've, I've um, exposed this in my um, presentations at length, mm-hmm. how, yeah, how the whole thing is about paying indulgences. And the uh, scribe and a notaries are the ones who write the indulgences because that's what scribe and a notary means. It means a writer of indulgences. <laughs> and so every summons and every um, piece of court document is actually, uh, they are indulgences. <clears throat> so the Inquisition's still on and it's all ecclesiastical. So the elites have got it down pat. They know how to control the masses. It's political, it's financial. 
and it's religious. And that's and it's all run by Rome. I mean, it's really fascinating. One one thing I've heard you talk about before that I hope you can elaborate on is the truth behind the birth certificate. You know, I always thought it was a little silly that we needed it, but apparently there's an underlying meaning to why it exists. Yeah, well, it's um it's supposed to be a protection for the individual legally, but because the bank system has usurped the natural organic government, if there ever was such a thing, I mean, <laughs> it's right. people people do do still believe that um, the first constitution of 1778 was really, really an authentic organic document to to just not to establish the rights because they are God given, <laughs> but to, to declare the rights of the individual. And so they think it was a, a fair organic document, whereas other researchers beg to differ. <clears throat> they suggest that it was, you know, just something for the elites to protect their wealth. Mm -hmm. And but but they made it appear to be a constitution and a bill of rights and um, declaration of independence and all of those. The Articles of Independence or, um, and whatnot, um, which spawned the Republic. But see, what happened was there was the 1871 incident, uh, and that's um, after 10 years of amending the Constitution and all sorts of things from 81 to uh, 61 to 1871, that decade that Abraham Lincoln lived in. They defined the person, they redefined person, you see, and they gave corporations personhood. And then in 1871, of course, the act, they enacted the, um, the new um, government in D.C., you see, and it's, that's the Vatican government. So in that decade, the Vatican came back <laughs> to take its rightful place because mm -hmm. in... From their from their perspective, they were the ones that funded the elite families funded all the, the first ships that that came over and and established colonies and and companies and what have you, and so therefore they continue to see that as their property. <clears throat> That's why the um, the New World was always considered to be the property of England or the property of France or of um, Holland, you know, or these conquering countries, but behind them all was the Vatican because they had the uh, the so-called treaties, like the Treaty of um, Tordesillas, uh, Torcedillas. I hope I got that right. Yeah, Torcedillas. <laughs> <laughs> I usually say Tordesillas, and people pull me up. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the treaty there, where the uh, Pope of the time, I think it might have been Alexander the one they're making the current movie about, the Borgia Pope. He was Spanish, and um, I think it was him, that one. And they signed this treaty, and in um, 1493, and gave the lands to, um, between the Vatican families, whoever they are, and the so-called Columbus families. And that's the contract, and that's they always um, defer back to that. <laughs> yeah. So no matter, so this ownership thing where they tell you you can go and get a plot of land, which they call a lot, an allotment, go and grab that, and we'll give you a title, and um, and you can own it. Well, it's an illusion because they really don't give their property up that easy. <laughs> so. They know that from behind the scenes, from on top of the system, they control it all because they have the treaties. They have the, the, the contracts, you see. Mm -hmm. And the Vatican has the, Trump, the contract that trumps them all, <laughs> all of them. And that's the Holy See, the Crown and the Commonwealth. These were well established in the days of Constantine and even further back in the days of the Flavians and even back further in the days of the Julians. So this is a 2,000-year-old thing. Rome is a kingdom of ideas, and it's about to fall. <clears throat> and, and all of the ideas, we're still using them. They are draconian. They are antiquated. <clears throat> they come from an old way of thinking. It's the old order. This is why they keep trying to sell us the new world order, because what they're trying to do is give us another version 
of Rome, <clears throat> another the Fourth Reich. You see, the First Reich was was Rome. The Second Reich was the um, the Holy Roman Empire, which lasted for a thousand years, uh, from Charlemagne to uh, Napoleon's time. <clears throat> and then the Third Reich, well, so-called Third Reich of Hitler, to establish. Uh, you know, a third because he went in league with the Vatican. You see, he, he signed a concordant, mm-hmm. concordant with the uh, with the Vatican, with Pope Pacelli, and um, at the time, Cardinal Pacelli, of course, and um, and that was a the Third Reich. In other words, Rome, Mark III. But Rome doesn't go away that easily unless the Vatican is totally dismantled and thrown into the abyss, which it will be, um, we, we, you know, we'll, never, we'll never get rid of this control system and, and the way it works and everything. It's all Roman. It's a kingdom of ideas, and it's the last great materialistic beast to fall before peace can come on this planet. Well, I was hopeful that we were in the midst of that when the Pope retired because that was such an unprecedented move. But, you know, typically I'm very cynical that we'll get over these kind of things because I just don't see the awakening happening on the level that I feel like it should. Um, but, you know, you've presented some information that you think that this is – this age of awakening is something that – it's it's beyond us. It's something that we are going to go through regardless if we want to or not. There's a mechanism there uh, in the universe that – that would put us through that time is is that kind of correct is that what you found yes um this is a process this is the way the universe gets things done i mean um everything ascends like a distillery you know like water Mm -hmm. the sun in the solar system is able to draw the molecules of water and separate them and is able to cause the vo- the water, <clears throat> which is quite heavy, but just the rays, the warm rays of the sun in the atmosphere, pull the water up and cause the clouds. And the philosophers <clears throat> explain that this is how the sun draws souls. The sun, the solar, is not on- only the chief vital force of the solar system, <clears throat> but it's the chief spiritual force. It's the spirit part of our nature. And it draws the souls, and all souls that have incarnated in this solar system uh, will ascend, except for, uh, of course, um, so-called evil souls that are willfully destructive and and um, and very very uh, intent on doing harm to others. But and this is called the cycle of necessity. We are all on the cycle of necessity. We are all at a different stage of development and and growth and evolution spiritually. No one person is the same or at the same level. And um, that's because we are on the cycle of necessity. And in the scriptures, in particular in, um, look, I think it might be Matthew chapter 16, if I'm not wrong, uh, where it talks about there that uh, an owner of a vineyard, he um, <clears throat> contracted some workers for um, one denarii to work for a day, which which was to the value of a day's labor. <clears throat> but the the beautiful parable, it's a beautiful parable, and it explains how we reincarnate in the cycle of necessity and how we graduate from this cycle as we do the good work. So some are ascending quicker than others, and the only reason we have, we have um, holy scriptures and, and holy saint-like people in history is to push that process along, but it's going to happen naturally anyway. Um, all things will be drawn to, to the creator, <clears throat> to the light. But the parable um, is beautiful because <clears throat> it speaks how the uh, owner of the vineyard went into the um, into town and contracted other laborers to go out and work in the vineyard. Some started at midday, some started at the third hour of the afternoon, and some started at the last hour to work, and they were all contracted with the same amount of money. So when it came time at the end of the day to pay the workers, the ones that came last that only did an hour of work, they were paid the same money as the, the ones that were employed from the morning. Mm-hmm. And so the, so the ones that were employed in the morning complained to the master and said, but master, <laughs> we've been working all day. 
And then these guys only rocked up an hour ago and they get the same amount of money. And then the master says, well, am I doing you an injustice? Didn't we contract for one piece of money at the end of the day? And that's what I'm giving you. <clears throat> and so this is a beautiful parable which explains that some reincarnate and, you know, perhaps only take a few thousand years to find themselves to do the good work and reascend. Whereas others <laughs> linger in limbo or purgatory or call it hell, the lower regions, for a longer time. Um, Celsus, Celsus, the second century philosopher, um, in his book Against the Christians, the true, the true um, logos, the true word, he mentions there that Empedocles spoke about 30,000 years as the average period of the cycle of necessity for each soul to be able to learn their, well, not necessarily learn their lessons, but remember who they are, experience all the things that the Creator wishes to experience through their soul, and then return and ascend. And so being a sovereign, <clears throat> for want of a better word, I'll use sovereign because it still does contain its true essential meaning, the, the sovereignty movement and the lawful movement. See, people have discovered now that, that they have been subjected to positive law or man-made law <clears throat> and not natural law. And so they're opening their eyes and, and beginning to see this and demanding that we return to this beautiful natural way of law, do no harm. We don't need thousands and thousands of laws and or well, laws <laughs> well it's even laws but uh, we yeah. have enactments and statutes and bylaws and codes and people are getting thrown into jail through these codes you know <laughs> right endless bureaucracy oh that's ridiculous it is man let's let's back it up a little bit because of all the lies and cover-ups that we've been victim to, you've said the biggest lie is the Jesus Savior story. And Kyle and I both got stuck going to Catholic school growing up. We realized that this uh, story is bullshit, realized it pretty early on, but your work is bringing me back around to the idea that rather than Christianity and the Jesus motif just being a mechanism for control, it might also disguise some underlying ancient truth that's been purposely weeded off the planet um, can you walk us through a bit of that lie and how the truth is coded in the Bible and in Christianity? Yeah, for sure. Look, the Gospels are nothing other than um, sacred writings based on the workings of light. <clears throat> this is why, you know, the, the uh, Gospel of John in particular, uh, the first chapter talks about Jesus coming to the world and the light which was from above and those from below did not recognize that light, etc., etc. And so it's dealing with light. And sometimes Jesus or the Christ takes on the character of the sun. Sometimes it takes on the archetype of the higher consciousness. But all of the characters, every single individual character in the Bible, except for um, um, uh, post uh, what's what what what's that called when they um, they put things in um, <clears throat> what's the word in in um, oh, retrospect? Yeah, stuff they added way later. Yeah. So, um, like for instance, the name of Qu Quirinius, the governor of uh, Syria, uh, the 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 name Pontius Pilate. These these occur in history. This was done by the uh, well. I think the Flavians did that. They, they, you see, these are documents that are, that are based on light, but they are slightly mutilated. What happens is gospels are written by, uh, philosophers, um, astronomers, uh, wise men and women who understand that the only gospel there is, is the one in the stars. You know, the 12 signs of the zodiac are the 12 apostles or the 12 apostles. Notice the word post in apostles. Uh, notice the word disc in disciples. Um, it's all dealing with the, the disc of um, the zodiac. And so, and as you, as you begin to look upward and pay attention to the glorious works of the Creator, then you begin to realize that the only gospel there is is the gospel of the zodiac. 
and the son is the Christ who does his work with his 12 apostles. And so bringing, bringing about the seasons and the harvest and the wine and the bread, two symbols of Christianity. And so these, these gospels, what happens is uh, when Egypt is ruling the world 4,000 years ago, the hero of the gospel is Osiris and his helpers have their separate respective names and they go helping that Lord and, you know, he is, is the one that brings vitality and spirituality and, and goodness to the people of Egypt. But, but what happens is uh, then Greece comes along and they also historize their documents. Uh, Plutarch in the uh, first century the priest of Delphi, he said that there was a certain guy called Ephemeris. And he said this idiot Ephemeris went around the globe collecting myths and legends and historicizing them and bringing them down to earth and making them literal human heroes. And this is where we get the expression. And, and, and Christianity Christianity is suffering with this. <laughs> they have also been deceived. Uh, the, the, the Roman elite have deceived them. They have created the greatest Ponzi tax collecting scheme in history. Um, because all of the, the IRS, rest assured, I can prove this. <laughs> uh, I won't be able to do it in an hour, an hour, but I can prove this. The IRS are collecting money for Jesus, rest assured. It's all about Jesus. <laughs> it's all about the historical Jesus that never came and never will return. It's um, it's the literal rendering. You see, even the Bible itself tells you that the, the letter of the word is, is uh, putting to death, but the spirit of the word is vivifying because people who un only understand the scriptures literally suffer with a blindness, it's a spiritual blindness, because there is much, much more... <laughs> <laughs> to these documents that meet, than meets the eye. And mm -hmm. the story that is in there is clear. And it's only clear to people who have ascended uh, their light and done the good work and who can see with the mind's eye. And these people become what are termed and categorized as witches, <laughs> heretics, astrologers, uh, seers, and they are branded as lunatics um, and they are ostracized because they are not belonging to the orthodox way. And a lot of them end up in psych um, you know, psychic wards of, of mental institutions um, because the powers that be uh, want that. You see, they, they want these people out of the way, out of sight. And they've been persecuted since Hypatia, even back. You know, we've, we've, we've had these luminaries that have come, Socrates, Seneca, all these uh, were put to death, um, Boethius, Giordano Bruno, uh, Pico della Mirandola, um, all of these guys were teaching exactly the same thing as I am. I'm not original at all, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just mm -hmm. <laughs> standing on their shoulders and I feel like an idiot when I speak <laughs> compared to them, you know. And so, because, yeah, because <clears throat> I'm just a, you know, I'm just a, a baby novice student of the great knowing ones of the past. There's two kinds of philosophers that are idolized in this world. There's thinking ones, you know, these intellectual types with their great theories. They're thinking men, you know, great mm -hmm. men of critical thinking, rational men, <laughs> philosophers. Right. They're basically just idiots, you know, uh, men like Darwin, full of theories, no truth, you know, no real knowledge because it's based on his senses. All the information he gathered was based on his five senses. And Walter Russell says that this is um, imperial reductionism. Uh, is that right? I'm just uh, having a bit of a... Um... <laughs> I don't know, man. Well, yep. Yeah, what I'm trying to say <clears throat> is that um, they are gathering their information by what they observe with the senses. It's not knowing. Right. You see, so, so this, is, this is one kind of philosopher. They get you know, Nobel Prizes and awards and all sorts of things. 
and these these philosophers are glorified in the universities today, whereas the the true knowing philosophers, your Pythagoras, Orpheus, Plato, these men, you know, they we seem to you know treat them now in the universities like oh yeah you know a bit strange kind of people those people um uh, but you know they've got some genius about them but um it's the the thinking ones these days that are that are praised you know this is why we have hegelian dialectic and we have malthusian uh schemes you know because they mm-hmm. they get their the elites get their um their uh, teachings from their favorite thinking philosophers absolutely Hegel. Uh, Darwin and Malthus and these guys, you see, rather than getting them from, you know, the the Hermes and the Jesuses, because when you when you read the Gospels, and by the way, <laughs> one thing must be said: we know that the words of Jesus are not the writings of Jesus, do we not? Right. Well, because nowhere in the Bible does it say this is what Jesus wrote. Um, whereas Matthew, Mark, Luke and John all say, and Luke in particular says, I gathered this information from hearsay. <laughs> Those Gospels are all hearsay. Right. Luke, Luke heard from someone and wrote down the Gospel. Right? Um, and so, and so this, this is another way that we can really, really, really truthfully see with our mind's eyes and with our hearts that know all truth that the Bible is a literary work because no one's owning up to have written any stuff in there. <laughs> right. Well, well, Moses is, but, but, but Moses is a different kettle of fish. <clears throat> Here we have the Savior, the one that truly, truly came to save mankind, supposedly turned up here for 33 years but didn't write anything. Right. Said a lot of stuff. Well, and that... so now it's all, and now it's all hearsay. So it's very convenient to do it that way. You know, this is the way you can control it because then you can twist the words. Mm-hmm. And you it... see, because it's all hearsay. It does seem that it's an instrumental aspect of the European expansion was always to stamp out the the culture the, of the people they were dominating, and those cultures usually had a more natural view of the world. But I've heard you talk about Jesus as just symbolizing the sun is that correct i mean our our sun of course our sun yes in particular that's the savior the lord that rises <laughs> look right. every eye every eye shall see him i shall return the way i i i, I departed yeah, because when the sun sets you turn around 12 hours later and there it is rising mm-hmm you know, it's it, the risen saviour. Why do we have these expressions? Why is the resurrection of Jesus celebrated in, Mar- in um, April, March, April uh, in the sign of the Lamb, Aries? Because it is. It's the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb. It's the sun. When the sun reaches Aries, it's the Lamb of God. When it reaches Leo, it's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from that sign. Leo rules the zodiac. It's the hottest month of the year. You know, when it reaches the sign of Aquarius, it's the son of man. Huh. When it reaches the sign of Pisces, it's the fisherman of men. When it reaches Taurus, it's the rock. Taurus has always been known as the rock. When it reaches Gemini, it's the twin. There's many paintings in, in Byzantine art that depicts Jesus as a twin because it's Gemini. So the sun in, in Gemini is a twin. Then when Jesus the Son reaches cancer, it's the scarab, and my Lord the scarab. How many church fathers say Jesus is a scarab, he's a beetle, he's my beetle, he's my holy, holy beetle, because beetle is the, sign, the, is the, the scarab, is the, is the crab of cancer. Then uh, when it reaches Virgo, it's the one that serves. Virgo is the sign of service. And so the Pisces Virgo axis, axis of the equinoxes that we've been under for the last 2,000 years. The sun has been in Pisces for 2,000 years, the vernal equinox, and the autumnal equinox, its opposite, has been in Virgo. This has been 2,000 years of Christian, the fisherman, Jesus, Jupiter Zeus, and Virgo, the age of service, the age of belief and doubt, because one fish believes and one fish doubts. And so when the sun arrives at the tropic, at the uh, sign of Libra, it's the just one, the one who's come to judge. 
because Libra is the sign, the middle, the middle of the year. It's the middle of the sine wave. It's the middle, it's, it's the 23rd of September is the other equinox. So the, the, it's virtually 180 degrees from Aries, the start. So it's the middle of the circle. And it judges. Then when the sun reaches Scorpio, it becomes the, uh, be cautious as doves and wise as serpents. Because the dove and the serpent are the two animals of Scorpio. Then when the sun comes into Sagittarius, it is the one who says, I have come to uh, divide the world. Because the arrow of Sagittarius on the 21st of December, the, the solstice, the, la- the shortest day of the year, where Sagittarius is pointing with his arrow, that's the dividing mark. That's the solstice. Huh. Sagittarius is there at the solstice, pointing to it, and waiting for the 21st of December, the solstice for the sun, and, and, and I have come to divide the world. Then when the sun is in Capricorn, it's, it's, it's the carpenter, because the motto of Capricorn is, I create, I use, and it's the Masonic symbol, the goat. And so, and so you see, we have the complete the wheel, the you know, King Arthur and his twelve knights right. of the round table, Jesus and his twelve disc eyeballs. And um and so when you look at Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, you see Jesus is in the middle of twelve disciples, six to his right, six to his left. They are grouped further into groups of three. So on Jesus' left, on your left as you look at the Last Supper, you see Aries to the left with his hands on the table at the head of the table. No other disciple is at the head of the table. All the other 11 are behind the table because Aries is the head. It's in the head of the human organism. Pisces is at the feet, the two feet. So if you follow Leonardo from Aries from the left, you will see that he has thrown in some ciphers very conveniently. For the ones with eyes to see, of course. And uh, you will notice uh, every single individual apostle from the left to the right, from Aries to Pisces, you will see secret hand um, positions that indicate that uh, Leonardo da Vinci knew who the disciples were. Aries, Taurus, Gemini. In fact, when you get to the third... You can do this right now. You can Google the Last Supper and go to images and you look at the third disciple from the left and you'll see that he, <laughs> he's, sta- he's sitting there with his two hands in front of his face, almost obscuring his face. Yes, well, because the two twins, Gemini. The third sign is Gemini. It rules the arms and the hands, the shoulders and the two lungs. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. That's pretty interesting. He's got both his hands up, palms up. And to Jesus' left, you will see a green Venetian ruler of Libra with her arms outstretched. Why is that very effeminate-looking apostle uh, stretching out his arms? Is he yawning? Is he tired? Uh, Or is she? Because it's Venus. Um, and to Jesus' right is Virgo, and Cancer is pointing to the Adam's apple, showing that there is no Adam's apple in this disciple. It must be a woman. Well, it is. It's the virgin. And so um, these knowing ones, Leonardo was not a thinking philosopher. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, he was a knowing one. He knew the science, and he was conveying that through his art to the world leaving them a message saying one day when the Enlightenment comes in five or six hundred years when Saturn returns in the age of Aquarius and Uranus, you will understand this picture and you will know where I'm coming from. You will know that I knew the science of all sciences called the perennial philosophy. That's fascinating stuff, man. <clears throat> yeah. That, uh, you know, that definitely painted a little bit of a picture for me before. Uh, one other thing I really wanted to get to, um, it's probably a slightly lengthy topic, so we should probably try to get it in. The ascension story and the, the whole ascension into heaven story is an analogy for human enlightenment. How does this relate to the pineal gland? Yeah, well, in the Bible, pe- the pineal gland is called Penuel, and that's the place that uh, Jacob 
the place where he saw God face to face, and he called that place Pinuel, which is, you know, just a play on the word Pineal. It's the Pineal gland. Mm -hmm. Because, because Jacob, when he ascended the ladder, he had a dream. He placed his head on a stone. That's the stone of scone or the sacrum, which is the second most bottom portion of the spinal column, the vertebrae, the 33 vertebrae. There are five bones that are fused just above the coccyx, coccyx, which are composed of four fused bones. And this is the sacrum. <clears throat> this is called the sacred part of the, uh, the, the spinal column. And this is where Jacob lays his head and then he sees a ladder, which is the spinal column. Uh, and he sees angels descending and ascending and he ascends the ladder. He struggles with an angel gets a name changed to Israel and then he sees I've seen he says I've seen God face to face and he declares the name to, because he has lived and not died he declares the name Peniel and so <clears throat> what this is secretly talking about uh in the esoteric uh understanding of the scriptures is that we are ascending the beautiful oil <clears throat> which is called in, um, if you look at Sante's anatomy or um, Gray's anatomy, it will be called chrism, the fluid in the in the cerebrospinal system, which is produced in the claustrum, in the cerebellum, in the uh, cerebrum. Um, this oil descends down to the sacrum and then ascends through the uh, spinal system, the cerebrospinal system returns to the optic thalamus at the top of the uh, medulla oblongata, <clears throat> and this is the chamber. This is called the chamber, you see. Mm -hmm. This is, um, yeah, this is, for instance, the initiation chamber, the third ventricle in Sante's anatomy. The third ventricle <clears throat> is the cave of Brahma, and this is where, once the oil ascends, the pineal gland is there, see, at one end of the optic thalamus, and at the other end is the pituitary gland. <clears throat> so when the oil ascends and reaches these glands, electric energy arcs in the pineal gland, and this electric energy is sent through the uh, foramen in the, uh, in the, um, the fornix. There's a special little place in the, in the midbrain, and it's called the, uh, the fornix. Mm -hmm. And... Um, once this electrical arcing reaches the um, the fornix, uh, this is illumination. The pineal gland produces a new uh, secretion, which is called the blood of the Christ, which saves. And this uh, balances the blood, the chemical composition of the blood, and restores the health of the individual and activates the dormant brain cells in the cerebrum and this is the resurrection. The dead, this is what is called the resurrection of the dead. The dead shall rise because the dead refers to the spiritually dead. No one is saved, quote unquote, unless they have restored themselves to their higher processes, to their higher state and remembered who they are. And is there a way we can work on that on an individual level? Meditation and and entheogens would be sort of more a synthetic uh, <laughs> you know way of doing that, but entheogens are certainly admissible. Uh, I actually just had my first DMT experience not more than uh, ten days ago. Yeah, well, it's an artificial way of inducing <clears throat> the whole experience of ascending the consciousness, but certainly um, you know do not neglect your meditation and um, yes. Restore yourself to your higher mind by going within. And once, you know, you, the light is restored, uh, you become clairvoyant. You don't become so much a medium of this information, you become a clairvoyant and you know this information. You have direct access to this information. And you have downloads, you know, you have downloads of understanding. And so, and what you do is you shed your lower perspective of 
seeing the world. You know, I mean, you can't, for instance, when you get in, a, in a, an aeroplane, how many things have been discovered by traveling in aeroplanes? All those pyramids in, in um, Mesoamerica were discovered. The Nazca lines in Peru were discovered uh, by raising the perspective. There are things on the ground that you just don't see. This is why the pineal gland must be reached because along the cerebrospinal system there are seven uh, plexuses or nerve ganglions and these are called chakras in the uh, eastern system and these correspond to the seven levels of consciousness and if we are seeing things from the bottom chakra our perspective is different from at the elevated higher consciousness of the pineal area and the crown chakra so this is why we need to ascend the oil and we need to <clears throat> be ascended and raise our perspective then we see things more clearly we see that <clears throat> the anthropomorphic jesus in the bible is not a literal character it does not find its place anywhere in history it's a literary character and finds its place in our hearts this is why Jesus never did write anything. He is <clears throat> the inspiration of the Gospels. We are creators. We have the creating faculty. And so has the solar system. Therefore, this is what we call God. This is what we call Jesus, the Saviour. Our solar system. Because it is the local part of God, the creator, the cause which loves us and nurtures us. And so we love it because we have, only, we have only love for God's creation and the stars above are creators and we love them. And does not Job, the book of the Bible, talk about the morning stars, how they rejoiced and they applauded the creation, the physical creation of God? <laughs> Yeah. Because because the morning stars are the suns. It's talking about the suns. They are the creators. The light, the 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 the, the, vib the electrical vibration that emanates from their magnetic centers create forms. And we see those forms and we congratulate those forms. They are beautiful. Man loves to see the curves of the beautiful opposite sexed female. And the female loves to see the virulence and the um, magnificence of the masculine virility, you know, the masculine fire body. And they meet together and they have sex and they make love and they enter the higher consciousness depending on how they practice their sex. If they are what's considered to be fornicators and adulterers, um, you know, they will just indulge in lower bestial type of sex. But if they have affection and love and are more principled in their love, they will, um, rather than uh, practicing, um, you know, earthy type animalistic sex, they will practice divine sex. And they will raise the vibration and the oil of the chrism of Christ up the kundalini uh, from a fucus in Scorpio, one of the deacons of Scorpio in the generative system, up to the optic thalamus, which is Orion. So a fucus, one, when we practice sex, we are stimulating the serpents of a fucus, the kundalini and the kundabatha. Mm -hmm. And we are raising the energy and the oil up the spine because the cerebrospinal fluid is really a gas, really. It's the fish, it's the oil, it's the manna. It's the soma. It's the, the good oil. It's the bread. I am the bread of life. Bread. <laughs> and so as we ascend it and we practice more divine sex in the head, we raise the vibration of our sexual practices. Then we have orgasms in the, in the head rather than in the testes, hmm. which, which is um, actually... Um, discharging the electric and magnetic forces of the of the organism um you know i'm not condemning this and no one condemns this but um is a different it's just a different orgasm mm -hmm. and and so 
the ones that practice more a more sort of a tantric sex and raise the energy, they have what's called a pneumatic or a spiritual orgasm, which is uh, an orgasm in the mind. And these are far more sustained than the physical orgasm. The physical or- or- orgasm is fleeting, but but here um, one is able to experience their own blissful godlike nature. This is why. Um, animals and, and, and human beings that have physical orgasms rather than spiritual orgasms desire to have the orgasm because they want to know and experience their true, true nature and get in touch with it. Uh, but the philosopher, he, uh, declines from, he or she declines from having this type of orgasm and uh, seeks the one beyond the physical which is more emotional than spiritual, than mystical. There's four levels. There's the physical orgasm, there's the emotional, there's the spiritual, and the mystical. And they have to do with earth, water, air, and fire. And so when, when you realize and, and understand this science, you begin to free yourself. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Churchgoers are bound. This is what church means. Uh, a religion, relegare, is one derivative of um, of religion. The other one, um, well, it would be to reveal the the doctrines of truth. And mm-hmm. so, you know, mm-hmm. there's there's always a spiritual and a physical nature to religion. And this is why people hate religion because they see it as a physical thing, a me- mechanism, and they see religions, which are just corporations. Yes. They, yeah, they can't be anything but corporations because there isn't, you know, <laughs> Christ is and always will be the Christ within. Colossians uh, 1 26 and 27. Only the ignorant ones, according to the Apostle Paul, do not know this sacred secret. Hmm. And hence, and hence are awaiting for an external savior. The Christ is the process of the chrism and, and ascending the oil and the consciousness within. One saves oneself within, and this is why Christ is known as the Savior. You when see? you talk about these energies rising, it reminds me a lot of the coiled uh, serpent energy and this connection with the serpent and also with sex and the feminine. I think with Christianity in particular, their origin story in Genesis, you know, the scene with Adam and Eve and the serpent and uh, Yahweh and the tree of life, I think it it is meant in a certain way to diminish the feminine, to diminish sex, and then they instill with their morals all this shame about sex. So it seems like well, there's an intentional effort to move us away from this. Only, only, from, the, um, only from the controlling elite. Um, you know, so the, right. intent is, is, the intent is not in the scriptures themselves. These are literary, beautiful truths, and their beauty has been... Has, has been uh, um, um, bastardized it, exactly beautiful word there you go and 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 it, that has been done intentionally by the pedophile elite who want nothing more that, than to control people through all these corporate religions um, they are all fictional um, they all only exist in the imaginations of the um, the duped that go to these churches and there are I believe now thirty thousand registered Christian so-called Christian denominations, all of them are false. They're all condemning each other, and they're all um, telling you, <laughs> if you listen, <laughs> that they're uh, all going to hell because the, that's what uh, um, the Mormons are saying that the Seventh-day Adventists will do, and the Seventh-day Adventists are telling you that the Pentecostals will, and so they all will. And so what we have is you know, a system of, of great, great de- deception, and who does it serve? It serves the controlling elite. And what for? What is this the world they want? Is, it, is this the world they want where they, have to, um, where they have to invade other countries uh, with their partners and they perform operations? Libya was uh, two years ago when, when they, um, they decided to go into Libya to kill Colonel Gaddafi. That was an operation. Right. And, and Hillary Clinton was selling that as our partners. It, it, it's, these are corporate crimes. 
You see, these days, these corporations, these partners, they get together and they go around um, invading other countries to steal their oil and to steal their freedoms and to install central um, Rothschild-run, Rockefeller-run, uh, Vatican Jesuit-run um, central banks. Right. And whoever doesn't comply falls. And so there's murder and bloodshed in country after another. Look at Argentina in the 70s and Chile in the 70s. Look at Indonesia and yeah, uh, look at Vietnam. Look at Korea. Yeah. Look at um, time and time again. Yeah, Iraq and Afghanistan. And this is just corporate bloodshed. Is this the world that they want? Do they want to be the rulers of shit? Because that's it. They've got. They are. Yes, they're the rulers. Oh well, they must congratulate themselves and 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 feel very proud of themselves when they go to their Bilderberg meetings. And you know, there's Kissinger at one table, and uh, you know, and there's the other uh, imbecile. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, the other idiot who founded the um, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And, and they would be mm. congratulating these types, the Kissinger types, they'd be congratulating themselves at the Bilderbergs for being the controllers of all of this, you know, in their think tanks, in their, in their um, in meetings when they get together to control, to be the, the controllers of all this shit. So, you know, congratulations. They get, uh, you know, Barack Obama gets a Nobel Prize for being, you know, one of the powerful boys of ruling all of this world of shit. You know, there's right. security cameras everywhere. You know, before you board a plane these days, you've got to go through uh, full body scanners. You've, you know, they want to put their fingers up your bum to see if you've got some sort of a, you know, cracker or uh, some dynamite up there. They want to yeah. feel what's in your pants. They want to control everything. Well, this system now is, this is, we're tired of this, and even the elites are tired of this now, and there's many of them defecting and, and wishing for a better world. Why would you want to be – why would you disempower the world so that they distrust you and hate banksters and hate, um, you know, the controlling elite? Wouldn't you want to be loved? Wouldn't you – why don't they – just let go of this controlling system and the pedophilia and the people traffic and the gun, the guns traffic and everything because it's a world that's just full of turmoil and trauma and they get to be called the bosses of it. Well, right. guess what? They're going to be pushed aside and a new consciousness is going to take over and that will be one where of self-determination, number one, of knowing thy, thyself, knowing ourselves, number two, of tolerance, uh, forbearance, love, generosity. You know, to have a currency, not a fictional currency where a ruling elite derive um, financial benefit by just loading interest on it. Right. Um, you know, we can have a currency of love. I can say to you, brother, you know what? I'll do an hour on your show. How's that? And, you know, I'll do that on on Thursday when Thursday turns up and I'll stick to my word. True. And that's that's pretty good currency. Yeah. Um, you know, people benefit from that. I do. I've benefited from it. And so, you know, you rock up, you've got a sack of potatoes and you give it to your pumpkin farmer down the road and, you know, you, there's only abundance. There's no shortages. You know, the Bilderbergers and the, and the trilaterals, trilateralists and the Council on Foreign Relations, the UN, these are all criminal corporations right. that are just giving you services other than the abundance that is already there. They are there to tell you that there's shortages. Yes, they, they work hard. They are there to tell you. Yeah, they're working hard to tell you that, and they'll give you science, false science to back it up. And they'll say, there's a shortage of air, so you've got to pay carbon tax. There's a shortage of fossil fuel, so you've got to pay $3 a gallon at the tap. Everything's short, and, and yet I don't see shortages. I see abundance everywhere. I think a lot of people are starting to realize that, that the scarcity is a bit of an illusion, and especially with things like 3D printers. I mean, 3D printers, if they can print, any normal object, that right there, it's like, how do you charge for that when you can be when you're able to create infinite amounts of spatulas and plates and whatever you need? Everything is there for our taking. It's there. This is why 
the original um, uh, sanction and blessing to humanity is everything. There's many trees in, in the garden that I've planted eat to satisfaction. And that, what that means is there is, there is abundance everywhere. Multiply yourselves is, is the, um, the, the blessing from the universe, the universe of light. And not to restrict, not to limit, not to have limitations and, and, and shortages. There's no restrictions. And so governments are there to restrict. And so we need to really deal with this uh, fictional um, invention and these Ponzi schemes, the whole lot, lock, stock and barrel. You know, uh, as I said before, you can go back, you can go back to Constantine's family when Constantine, um, when um, late in the 4th century they discovered what was called the Donation of Constantine. Look it up. The Donation of Constantine is Peter's Pence. <clears throat> this is where they get their um, ecclesiastical authority to go around charging taxes through the... Um, IRS and the ATO <coughs> and all of these criminal organizations. <clears throat> it's Peter's Pence. It's nothing other than Peter's Pence. Rest, assu rest assured and know this one universal truth. You owe no money to anybody. There is no organization that exists that because they don't exist. They're corporations. They're corpses. They have no existence outside of paper and they cannot receive anything through not having any existence. And therefore, we are free, you see. Mm -hmm. We are free to, um, to keep all of our resources and energy and currency to ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, so, yet yeah, do not communicate with these illegal uh, blood-shedding entities called governments. You know, they, they are another creature. They are separate to us and they are... Um, rapidly descending into the abyss their, <laughs> with all their fictions with them. So learn, know who you are, and know that um, you know that we are all that is, all that was, and all that ever will be. And so it's time to to kiss goodbye the Roman fictions that have been invented, and and it's still being um, perpetuated by the uh, Roman elite. Because after all, that's what they are. Look at all the presidents of the United States. They're all one big family of cousins. Right, like yeah. Obama's related to, you know, um, Bush. And, yeah, they're all related. And Bush declares, they tell you that they come from these, from the Stuarts, from the Windsors, from the Plantagenets, from the, you know, um, the Tudors. And they tell you. And these are these families are the controlling elite. And they are inbred pedophile uh, people trafficking, um, pirate families who are behind all of the crime, all of the terrorism and vandalism of the earth. And we need to um, deal with them. So there you go, brother. <laughs> well said, man. Um, yeah, yeah, we've gone a little long. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I mean, uh, I do appreciate You know, I feel like I can see through the corruption, the manipulation. We do that on our own show a lot, but... I'm a bit spiritually retarded or, or constipated for a little better term. But, uh, you know, a lot of teachers and leaders and guests that I've had say that this is where the road leads to, uh, you know, there's no sense in uncovering the lies if you're not willing to deal with the truth. And, you know, you've had some eye-opening revelations during this conversation. I really appreciate it, man. If there's anything else you want to point out to the people, let them know what your website is once again. Is there anything else you're working on? Um, for the UK listeners, I'll be doing nine uh, engagements all through the UK, starting in the north near Scotland, going all the way down to Glastonbury. Um, so that'll be all of August. So check out my website, universaltruthschool.com, for the UK listeners. Uh, also, I'll be going to Italy before that. Um, at the end of July, I'll do four days in Florence, four days of presenting... Sovereignty, syncretism, the science of light, astrology, astrotheology. Um, and then in September, Holland and Italy. So if anyone wants to catch that, that's what's new in the um, uh, syncretism world for me. All right. Well, there you have it, people. 